Namaste, namaskaram, vanakam, namo namaha. Striving to live a balanced life. We live basically in a triune world. Just think for a moment that here we are on planet Earth, and life is possible because of the moon and the sun. Perfect balance. If we look at the science of life, we have the laws of motion, inertia, acceleration, action, reaction, which the Hindus understand as the gunas, tamas, and rajas, which bring an equilibrium or balance, sattva. In life, we have the law of thermodynamics. Work produces heat, heat produces light. This is essentially the Hindu lifestyle of the classic yogas, karma yoga, Bhakti Yoga, heat. Raja Yoga, light. If we look at the dynamics in physics, we have gravity and electricity and magnetism. This too we can look at in our own physical body. From the navel down is gravity, electricity at the heart, and the magnetic head. In the Hindu Yoga Dharma, we use the symbolism of the deities and the three sampradayas or sects within Hinduism. For example, in Saivism, we have Ganesha, Muruga, Shiva Shakti. That would be gravity, electricity, magnetism. Similarly, in Vishnuism, you have Ganapati, Krishna, Vishnu, Lakshmi, or Ganapati, Hanuman, Sitaram. And in the Shakti Dharma for the mothers, we have Durga, Lakshmi, Saraswati, gravity, electricity, magnetism. We also have a beautiful understanding in Shaktiism of before creation, the Absolute, which gave birth to the Big Bang, which now coalesced into the evolutionary point where we happen to be. This is Kali and Durga and Parvati. Look at nature itself. It seeks a balance of predator and prey, the balance of the seasons, wet and dry, or winter, spring, summer, fall. So actually, the first word for what we now call the Hindu dharma is Ritvijam, victory to Mother Nature, Bhume Mata. Because again, this is obviously the planet on which we live, which seeks its own balance. And in seeking a balance, we obviously swing from one extreme to the other, striving for this balance. We too, as humans consciously or unconsciously in various degrees, strive to live a balanced life. Look at the galaxies for a moment. The very galaxies themselves are a visual understanding of the balance of life. You have the zero in the middle, the eye, the black hole, and then the spiraling energies around it. This zero or spiral and the Quiet center is represented in Hinduism by the lingam, the zero, which obviously numerically the Hindus invented. And then the spiral is the spiraling snake, Nagdevata. So as humans, we seek to, in one degree or another, find this inner balance, recognizing obviously that we are a body with a mind and emotions. We seek to balance these three. Take care of the body and Innately, the body has its own understanding of balance without us even consciously having to do much as it seeks homostasis. You know, we don't really have to look for miracles very far. We live in one. Imagine if you had a car that could heal itself when it got damaged. But isn't that what our body does? We cut it, and basically we take care of the wound, but it heals by itself and becomes, in a sense, new. Seeking to understand and work with our three bodies in this sense, the physical, mental, and emotional, is actually what the Hindu classic yogas are all about. Karma yoga and hatha yoga work on the physical body. Bhakti yoga, the emotional body, and raja yoga, the mental body. Of course, as Hindus, we're also understanding that there is a witness behind this triality of life. There is the center balance, which is the Atmana, soul in English, if you will. But Atmana is 
not the mind, just like soul or spirit is not the body. It is, in a sense, the balance point, the middle point that is observing the triality of life, the body, mind, and emotions, the Atmana. And intrinsically, as Hindus, we study this triality of our masculine nature and our feminine nature to uncover the soul nature within. This is the actually the neurological study of our brain hemispheres, the pingala, the left masculine brain, and the idda or ida, the right feminine brain, and the shushmana, the spine, in which we experience the atmana. And above all, Hindus, though sometimes we forget it, should know that this is the target in life, if you will. We wear the bindu to find that soul within, that balance point. In the Vedas we read, Puram Bindu Vajri Purushtutaha. So the Hindus not only refer to their self as Indu Hindus, pronunciation is, is different, same word, and also as Bindus. Hindu Samudra Idiyarthi Vayub here. Hindu, with the support of the breath, grab a hold of the cosmic ocean within. Ancient, soulful, warrior, Bindu. Puram Bindu Vajri Purushtutaha. And as we strive to get our act together, so to speak, which actually is the meaning of the word religio, to link, and dharma, dri, to hold, yoga, to yoke, y-o-k-e. As we come together individually, we also come together outwardly. Nature does this. Male and female create a child. So you have the two extremes of male and female and creating the balance in the middle of the child. This becomes a happy family. We recognize this balance in Hinduism, where we recognize and worship both the masculine and the feminine. For example, Shiva Parvati or Shiva Shakti, Vishnu Devi, Sita Ram, Radha Krishna. And then ultimately we understand that we're ultimately seeking this male-female balance within ourself in the classic image of Shiva and Parvati merging into one, Ardi Narashwara, half man, half woman. A very simple yet profound image can help us to keep in mind this searching for balance in life. The simple child's instrument of the teeter-totter. Perhaps you remember in the playground, we get on each side of the teeter-totter and swing back and forth. And sometimes you'd have one kid that was much heavier than the other and would sit on one side and you'd be dangling, legs flailing in the air. So with the teeter-totter, this is life. We swing from one side to the other as we seek to live a balanced life from one extreme to the other. Actually, we sing this song to Shiva, Sada Lola Hara Nama Shivaya, the truth, Sada, of the swing Lola of life. We go from one extreme to the other. This is the hot and cold of life, the good and bad, the like and the dislike, the Raghavesha. And eventually this swing is destroying our ignorance as we, now as an individual, we walk up that teeter-totter and learn to balance in the middle so that neither end touches the ground. In order to do this, we must have one leg to one side and one leg to the other. This is the symbolism also of the the yin-yang symbol of the Taoist religion. In other words, we've known both extremes. We have to live life in order to find a balanced life. And living life means that we must choose. We must make wise choices, learn to keep commitments and promises. And then once we choose our relationships, our jobs, our hobbies, our religions, then we seek to find a balance within that. A classic Western movie of Karate Kid 1 has some very profound moments in there as Sensei Mr. Miyagi is teaching his student, Daniel son, to first and foremost choose. Either karate do or karate don't, but don't do karate just so, or you get squashed like a grape. 
use the analogy of walking down a road. Walk either right side or left side, but don't walk in the middle or you'll get squashed like a grape. In life, we don't want to be an inno, an in-name only person. We need to choose and then follow through. Don't play the fence. Don't walk halfway. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't be superficial. Choose first. That's the first lesson. In a sense, not to be in the middle, to choose. Then once we've chosen our relationships, our jobs, our religion, then we seek for a balance. This was his next vital lesson to his Daniel son, his we would call Chela Shishya in Hinduism, is to find and live a balanced life. So all of our problems in life, we can essentially boil them down to a lack of balance within us. We're talking about a mindset here, which often becomes projected into gender bias, race bias. But the problem is much deeper than that. It's about our unrefined ego nature, which we Hindus call the ahamkara or asvitta. And clearly we do not want to destroy our ego. That's a real fallacy. We want to purify it, make it our best friend instead of our worst anyone. Anyone who tells you to destroy your ego is probably setting up a cult where you worship the cult leader. That's definitely to be avoided. We want to purify this ego by living a balanced lifestyle. This ego nature that we all possess can sometimes swing from one extreme to the other. In one extreme, our ego can be very greedy, narcissistic. We call this lobha and its cousins krota and kama, anger and lust. These are the superiority mindset, the entitlement mindset of simply taking. This is the colonization mindset of simply taking from others. That's one extreme. And the other extreme is often to go to the extreme of capitulating. Avasa, when we just feel powerless and assume our inferiority complex. We can find this in all societies when we have negative hierarchy, feelings of superiority and inferiority, because this is a battle that we all have inside of us. Sometimes we feel superior, sometimes we feel inferior, but mightn't there be a third alternative, a balance point, when we balance in that teeter-totter, neither falling to one side or the other. We don't feel superior or inferior at all, but balanced in the middle. Again, this is where the, the soul comes in, the center point, the bindu, finding the inner atmana, as Hindus would say, atma darshana paramodharma. This is our supreme duty in life, along with all of our other very important duties, is to realize the balance point. And again, the Hindus wear this mark right between the eyes, though we often forget it and it becomes superficial and just a cosmetic gesture. Sada lolahara namah shivaya, the truth of the swing of life which destroys our ignorance. We can see this greed and capitulation in all societies. This is the mindset behind race bias, gender bias, sexism, on the one hand, there are those who are greedy and angry and lusty. And on the other hand, those who simply give in and capitulate. Sadly, when it comes to the Hindu yoga dharma, we have far too many Hindus who have simply capitulated to the invaders. We don't want to be greedy and arrogant, but there is a middle ground where we can stand up for ourselves. This is actually the center point. This is becoming a soulful warrior. Puram Bindu Vajri Purushtutaha, ancient Bindu Hindu, soulful warrior. When it comes to the various religions of the world, right up to the present time, we suffer, many of us, from these extremes. We may be the hard fundamentalist on one hand, those who view their religion as the one and every other one is in error at best, or outright evil. But the other extreme is to swing to the other side, and this is very universalist, new-agey, if you will. 
and there's often a fundamentalism to this universalism. Much of Hinduism today is infiltrated by this fundamentalist universalist concept. Many Hindus will, and swamis, etc., will say that they respect all the different religions of the world, but that's because they're really coming from a core of their understanding at this point of Hinduism, thinking that Hinduism, and if you really press them, it might be Vishnu, that is the deity that creates all things and absorbs everything unto him. So a little different than the pure fundamentalist who thinks every other religion is evil, the fundamentalist universalist fully embraces other religions, but if you really get deeply into their core belief, that's because they believe their deity is the one that absorbs every other thing. You can find this today in today's spurious yoga movement, where they'll say yoga is for everybody. So it's really a core of Hinduism without recognizing it, and then it's trying to absorb every other religion. We could look at this principle and call it the Nat principle, N-A-T. One's religion is not the way, fundamentalism, or the other extreme, no way. And no way means also always. Whether one says we have no way or always, it's saying basically the same thing. But mightn't there be a balance point in between having the way and then always universalism, between fundamentalism and universalism? Why not a way? N-A-T. Certainly, I think this is a mature attitude for any religious person to assume, and certainly we advocate this within Hinduism. Hindu dharma is not the way, and it's not a universal way. It's not for everybody. It is a way. N-A-T. And interestingly, the word nat, if we play with it a little bit, it has two extreme polar opposite definitions. To be natty, it's actually a nautical term, or used often by in the military when one is very properly dressed. Everything in their clothing is in perfect alignment. They're considered to be very natty, very prim, very proper. That's one extreme. The other extreme is the gunat, with a silent G, and that's to be a pest. So we can either fall on one side or the other of being a fundamentalist, or a fundamentalist universalist. Or we can be balanced in the middle and recognize that our religion is a way. It's not the way, and it's not no way. Hinduism is a very specific way, and it is not all-consuming. It doesn't consume every other religion within it. Then it would actually become more like a fundamentalist. So N-A-T. So finally, a very practical project to help all of us try to develop a more consciously balanced life. We could call this project AIM, A-I-M. So our AIM, our focus. In the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali says, Desa Bandha Chittasya Dharana, limiting the field of your mind, meaning focus. We need to have aims and goals in life. Remember, as Hindus, our goal is to realize our atmana, our soul. And we do that by living the classical Hindu yoga lifestyle. Karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raj yoga, jnana yoga, hatha yoga, mantra yoga, japa yoga, nada yoga, nata yoga, which all stimulates the inner awakening of kundalini yoga. This is the Hindu yoga dharma. So in Project AIM... And if we pronounce it I'm, A-I-M, I'm is the bija or seed mantra of Masaraswati, the Hindu female deity of knowledge, of grace, of beauty, arts, culture, purity. So we're aim, and we're aiming at a goal, a target. The center of the target is the red dot, the Atmana. So if we rearrange these letters, we can get six different combinations. As we go on this journey to realize our Atmana, who we essentially are intrinsically. So our aim can be A-M-I, Ami, Ami, Ami. Hmm, all about me. 
This is what we do in life. We, we are individuals. And you know why nobody understands us, because there's never been another you or me. So we're all in this together as we learn, as we go through this experience of life, learning who we are. So we have ami, 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 or we can arrange it M-I-A, my, Maya, Mia, 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 Mia. Or we can arrange it M-A-I, my, my, my. <laughs> it's still all about me. Till we maybe get to the conclusion, I am a, I am a, hmm, when we really start to ponder, who am I really behind all of this outer show, behind all of this duality, triality of life, which is natural. Life is division. It's very natural. It's what we do with that division that's of utmost importance. So we go in Project AIM from Ami, Mia, my, I am a, to what's the final rearrangement here? I am. Now we have the I on one side and the other or the many on the other side. But the balance is the ah in the middle, the Atmana. I am. And isn't it interesting? When they translate into English, this is apparently what Moses heard when he was speaking to the burning bush, which is obviously a very controversial story, perhaps a psychedelic experience. The deity said to him, simply, I am. Hmm, I am. I am the Atmana. This is the essence of the Hindu yoga. Dharma, tattvam asi, that thou art. I am the Atmana with a body, mind, and emotions. As all of us individually and collectively go through this life journey, and as Hindus we understand life journeys, samsara, or reincarnation, to ultimately realize the balance. There must be a purpose for all of this balance that we see right from the cosmos itself, from the galaxies to the cosmos to nature and the laws of nature and the laws of science and the recognition of our body, mind, and emotion and the societies that we live in, the various religions of the world. As we all go on this great eternal journey to what many say is ultimately a soulful realization, realizing who I am, the Atmana, the soul of love, light, and energy, Satchit Ananda, Jyoti Shakti Ananda Shanti, with Deha Mana Bhavaha, with a body, mind, and emotions. Enjoy this journey as we journey individually and collectively, seeking along the way peace and fullness and tranquility and prosperity for ourselves and others. Sarvesham svastir bhavatu, sarvesham shantir bhavatu, sarvesham puranam bhavatu, sarvesham mangalam bhavatu, and find compassion. In the Tirukurao it says, of all the ways compassion will prove to be the means to liberation. And compassion means that we first have passion. We must have passion for life. Find our inner warrior spirit, our youthful, loving warrior, the heart chakra. Muruganji, Hanumanji, Krishna, Lakshmi, the heart chakra being the youthful, loving warrior. So we have compassion for our fellow human beings and we wish them well, especially when they're sick and suffering and do what we can to help alleviate their sickness and their suffering. We're all in this together for better, for worse, learning. Sarve bhavantu sukinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhadrani pashyantu makashtya dukha bhagba bhit. And as individuals, does it not make sense for all of us to seriously look within and ask ourselves, is this true or not true? Asatoma asadgamaya. As we admit our ignorance and we move into our ongoing enlightenment, and that word is vital, enlightenment. In light we're meant to be. We all have this inner light of the Atmana. It's Jyoti. Tamasoma Jyoti Gamaya. And realize this essential intrinsic inner nature of the Atmana. Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya. And through it all, seeking Shanti, 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 peace, peace, peace. Namaste. Namaskaram. P.S. Prajna Samadhi. 
as a further practical exercise with Project AIM is to try and learn the art of juggling. Learn to juggle three balls. And in order to do this, one must be centered. You must look straight ahead. And with your peripheral vision, you will deal with the other two balls. So it's a very practical experience to try to learn this little art of juggling. It sets up the mindset of dosa drista mahor muha, seeing our defects again and again and again. Anything in life takes a lot of practice, a lot of effort. So see if you can accomplish this art of juggling. As a young boy, I was fortunate in my father's uh, small grocery store. He would teach me in off hours how to juggle. I bruised a lot of oranges and apples in the process. But it's a wonderful skill to accomplish. And it gives us that mindset of learning to focus straight ahead and dealing with the other two balls in the air and juggling all three, learning to juggle this triality of life, the saralolahara of life. And another very practical thing that we can do as Hindus, remember that True Hatha Yoga, our Hindu devotional postures. The so-called yoga of today is a total travesty. True Hatha Yoga, Hindu devotional postures are actually very intense, very deep, very profound within Hindu dharma, and actually not supposed to be on display the classic scriptures wherein we find these Hatha Yoga asanas detailed, all say the same thing. Hatha Vidya Bhaveri Yavate Guya Niveda Tu Prakasha Varano. Keep this Hatha Yoga secret because it's powerful when it's secret and it loses its power when it becomes openly displayed. It's not that others cannot learn this Hatha Yoga, but it must be done by a Hindu in a progressive manner. But in Hatha Yoga, we have the profound Vrikshasana or tree posture. And again, as Hindus remember, Ritvijam, victory to Bhumi Mata, we first learn from Mother Nature. In Hinduism, remember, a guru is someone or something within the Hindu Yoga Dharma that's teaching us lessons. The first guru is Bhumi Mata. Then we have our Mata and Pitas, and we may have many Hindu gurus as we go through our life, but the trees can become our guru jis. They teach us to be rooted and grounded, karma yoga. They teach us to reach up in devotion, bhakti, yoga, the strong trunk, that also sways and is flexible in the breeze. Guruji's, the trees, they teach us to branch out and flower in the royal state of raja, yoga, to the fruit of enlightenment, jnana, yoga. And within the fruit is the atmana seed that started the whole process as we go round and round through this life of samsara, this daily life of, as a soul, realizing who we are by following the classical Hindu yoga, religious, spiritual, scientific lifestyle, the roots of karma yoga, the tree of bhakti yoga, the flowering of raja yoga, the fruit of jnana yoga, karma bhakti raja jnana. This is the way to nirvana in Tamil land, chariya kariya yoga manyanam. This is the same as we just told you. Yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. How many times do we have to tell thee all of yoga is sanatan? Dharma, this is Hinduism. Watch your karma. Kanda, upasana, kanda, yana, kanda. This is the tree of the Hindu yoga. Dharma. Namaste.